Um, hi, uh, so uh, welcome to Chartbeat again. Uh, my name is Harry Wolf. Uh, I am a uh, front end engineer here uh, working on uh, our dashboards and our uh, applications across the uh, Chartbeat uh, sites. Um, my talk today is uh, From Closure to Angular uh, A Journey Between Frameworks. Um, quite, uh, yeah. So, uh, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, uh, Chartbeat uh, was using um, Google Closure Library. Um, uh, it was, in case you don't know what Google Closure is, um, it's a uh, suite of, uh, it's a JavaScript uh, library that um, is a thin wrapper around native DOM APIs that normalizes all of them um, and makes sure that when you're writing some code, it works across all browsers. Um, it's very low level, um, but so it doesn't like to really do that much for you. Um, but this is what powered all of Chartbeat's dashboards when we were first getting off the ground. Um, so it worked very well for us for a long time, but it did have a few problems. Um, for one, it was a little slow. Um, because it was so low level, um, you had to do a lot of the uh, heavy lifting of DOM manipulation yourself, um, actually going in and saying, you know, make this display block, make this like with 300 px, like whatever you have to do, it's very manual. Um, and because of that, it didn't let us sprint as fast as we wanted to. Like as a startup, you have to be able to build as quickly and as ugly as, as possible to make things work, <laughs> uh, which Google Closure was not the most friendly with. Um, another problem that we had was the community. Um, so inside of Google, uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, just to be clear, you're talking about slow as in time to market, not slow in terms of performance. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of performance, it's excellent because it is so low level, so you have very granular controls over uh, what's going on in the DOM. Um, not so the same as true as Angular, but I'll get into that yeah. more. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please just yell. <laughs> not too loudly, but just audibly. Um, so the other thing that was the problem with uh, Google Closure was the community. It's very big inside of Google, uh, but outside of Google, it's not that well known. Um, so that was a problem because uh, for a few reasons um, that created some friction for us um, because um, two main po points of friction. One, it was very hard to find a Google Closure engineer in the wild, except from Google, which is also hard to get uh, as well. Um, but also because um, it's also not that hip, I guess, for lack of a better word. Like nobody like wants to learn Google Closure because if you're not in Google, you don't care. Um, so what to do? So just to give you a little background, Chartbeat works in six week cycles. We work on our product for six weeks and then in the seventh week, we have a hack week where we kind of just get to play with something that we don't normally get to mess around with. Um, so. Uh, in this instance, when we had this problem of like, what to do to like, fix this issue that we were having with Google Closure, um, we figured that we should do uh, something a little different for this hack week. Uh, we decided to do a uh, JavaScript framework shootout. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I made it myself. Uh, um, so for the JavaScript framework shootout, um, pretty much the rules were every front-end uh, engineer uh, chose a JavaScript framework. Um, and went off into the wild and started uh, developing a demo that we could then uh, get back after the week and talk about and see what we, what we found. Um, so some of the frameworks that we like, investigated was you know, Backbone, um, we investigated uh, Ember. Um, surprisingly, we also investigated Angular. Angular that, that might be in the mix. Um, so can you guess who won? <laughs> Angular, yeah, <laughs> it's a hard question. Um, so yeah, so AngularJS, the next generation, yes. Um, so when we started with Angular, we got the chance to like start afresh. Um, we got to just pretty much just wipe the slate clean because it was just a whole unique uh, infrastructure. Luckily, we had the uh, luxury of doing so that there was new products on the horizon that allowed us to not uh, worry about backwards compatibility. So we could actually literally just start fresh and take what we've learned in the past and then adapt it for the future. Um, some of the things that we thought about was, uh, so when Charpy started off, we had one dashboard. We had like one just like real-time analytics dashboard that could tell for your site what was going on. That was fine, and that was how we structured our code. Uh, today, Charpy has uh, like multiple product verticals. We have the, the publishing uh, app, uh, uh, product, and we also have the advertising product. 
um, and just the amount of things that we do is more. So the question is, how do we structure the code that is beneficial and helpful in development? Does that make sense? Um, so we had to figure out how to make this application structure scale. So um, we came up with a solution. Uh, it's been working with us uh, pretty well so far. Um, it's, yeah, pretty well so far, it's been working. Um, so to give you an idea, this is actually like if you go into our GitHub repo uh, and look in front, into the front end folder, front end ng, literally for uh, next generation, but also for Angular. It's a nice little like, if you want to talk to, you can change the meaning. Um, you shouldn't name things by its name, it's bad practice. Um, but so yeah, so in the front end ng directory, you have here you know, the advertising product, the Sharpie Publishing, CVP Sharpie Publishing product. This common directory, I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second. Labs, marketing, and open source, I'm going to talk about uh, at the end. Um, so what we actually ended up doing was, yes? This, this is public? No. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but if you worked here, it would be available to you. Uh, this is actually like pruned, like there was, there's like a node modules directory in there, Bower components that was distracting, so I took a screenshot and like, yeah. I, a developer Photoshop, which is not It was good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, your career in mind, so. No. Um, so, um, what we actually ended up doing was modeling um, our directory structure in the way in which Charpy worked. Um, so we actually work in like cross-functional teams, like we have a uh, publishing team, we have an ads team, um, and we actually made the code structure reflect that, so there was less friction as we actually developed. Um, and that was, it's been working really well so far. We also have this idea of the common directory. Um, so in any company that you work at, you will have code that is shared, and especially as you get bigger and you have multiple teams working uh, uh, async, like just alongside in parallel, um, you're not gonna be able to communicate as much, but you still want to be able to share code that is common to both those teams. Um, and that's what we've done with the common directory. For example, we have, um, a thing we call the feed service, which is how we make API calls, and that's a simple wrapper around the uh, HTTP service in Angular. Um, pretty much, that's sweet. Um, all right, so pretty much in the common directory is any code that is shared across all products. And this is on a product level. Um, any questions so far? Good. Uh, so now to delve a little bit deeper, let's open up the advertising directory. So like in the advertising product director, we have multiple applications or dashboards. Um, so we have like, you know, campaign, all these other types of dashboards. And in here you'll notice we also have a common folder as well. Uh, what we've done here is that within an individual team, there is some code that is shared amongst that team, but not necessarily uh, between products. Uh, that's just the way that we've seen things shake out. Um, if there ever was the case that there was a piece of code that was being used by the ads team that all of a sudden the publishing team needed to use as well. We physically take that code and move it into the upper, into the higher root level common directory so it could actually physically represent the way in which it was used. Um, this allows for just intuitive usage of the code and the layout of things. Um, yeah, so that's about that. So now let's actually delve into an individual application. Let's open up a common uh, campaign directory. Aha. Now, this is where it gets really fun. Uh, so like if I was to make my own, like, my own website, like as a, just a fun thing to try out, this is pretty much how I would lay out my code. It's been working out pretty well for me, uh, for all of us. Um, so you can see here we have this gold file. We're using gold. Come on in. Uh, welcome, welcome. No worries. <laughs> Glad you came. Um, <laughs> so uh, in the root of the directory, we have uh, a gold file. We're using gold. Um, as our build process. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, uh, my uh, buddy Jem is going to be talking about I don't know where, where is he? Oh, he's behind the pole. All right. um, so yeah, so Jem will be talking a little bit more about how we use Gulp, but um, every individual application at Sharpie has its own individual Gulp file to represent that it is, like if one day we wanted to separate these into separate repos, we could, because they are uh, aside from the common stuff, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, they're all self-contained. Um, so you have the gold file, package JSON. You have views, uh, tests, and styles. Those 
The views are partials that you use with like ng include to make sure you don't have like one huge file that has all the code ever that you'd want to use ever, which would just make your eyes bleed over from reading like 2,000 lines of code in one file. Um, so we also have the test folder, which uh, are styles. No, the tests. They're actually the tests. Um, just to confuse people. Um, no, so we have tests and styles, where you, and then so that's the uh, associated file. So what's interesting, where it gets a little bit interesting is here with uh, components in JS. Um, so uh, in researching the best way to lay out our code, uh, we came across two concepts of styles for laying out your code, one called by type, another by pod. Um, excuse me. Um, the idea is that, so by type is literally by type of the file. So like you have, you know, all your controllers in one folder, all your directives in one folder, et cetera. Uh, by pod is grouping your files by uh, the function, by the uh, functionality that it provides. Um, for example, if you have like a tooltip uh, component, that would be one pod that would contain, you know, the JS file, which is the directive, the style sheet, the less file, and the uh, template as well, all in one directory. Um, so we actually went with a kind of hybrid approach, um, where we have uh, the components directory, which uses the pod file system. Um, and then also the JS directory, which uses the type file system. So literally the only thing that differentiates where, uh, when you should then opt into the uh, pod system is um, a component is anything that requires more than one file uh, for its function, for it to function properly. Like as I was saying, a tool tip, you need the directive file for it to function, just functionality, but it also requires the styles for it to actually be laid out correctly on the DOM. Um, at that point, you're up to two files. Automatically, it should go into the components directory. No questions asked, just how it should be done. Um, so that's the main difference that we have. Then also in the JS directory, we have controllers, directive services, filters when there is a need for a filter specific to a dashboard. Um, and we also have this uh, app.js file, uh, which is how you, this is where we declare an Angular module. Um, we have one module per product. Um, and we also have the routes uh, file, which uh, defines the routes. <laughs> Thankfully. Did other things, you'd be very confused. Um, so that's kind of how we're structuring each of our dashboards. Like that's what powers the Sharpie publishing dashboard, um, the, labs, uh, the labs page, the big board. Um, they're all mirrored the same way. Um, and then, like if you're in the campaign dashboard, you can then use the Common, the files in the common directory relevant to uh, ads, but also to the front end NG at large. And allows it to then just keep the scope there. Um, any questions there? Sounds good, makes sense, good idea, bad idea, an idea, yeah. So the common code, um, you said you guys drop the data and like, put it in a higher directory. How do you make sure like dependencies are, like something doesn't break Let's mm. say somebody else is like using a like there's an API dependency, right? And then you need to break and change. So does everybody have to change their API or do you do versioning? So there's no versioning that we have internally. Um, there is the awareness. So that's what the benefit of having a file in a common directory does is that when you are modifying a file in there, you innately know that there are uh, like let's say you're modifying it because like the thing you're working on yeah. like needs that change. Because it's in the common directory, you know that other files are depending upon that. So you have to then go and like, you know, test those other things as well. Uh, it's, you know, reliance reliance on our front engineers to make sure that we don't screw each other over. Um, but there's no like versioning that we have. Um, but yeah, uh, delving in a little bit more, most of our common, uh, common files declare themselves as their own modules, um, as opposed to like, so we have like, you know, ads.campaign as the module name. Um, for feed service, that is its own module name. Do you make these modules uh, get some modules as well? I'm going to get into that in the next section. Okay. I just had a quick question. So for the components, you have both the JavaScript and then CSS within both of each module itself, right? Yeah, so I should have included a screenshot, but like for the tooltip directory, in that tooltip directory, we have uh, cbtooltip.js, cbtooltip.less, we're using less, mm -hmm. uh, cbtooltip.html, all in that same directory. And you just basically include it into whatever you want to 
Yeah, it's a little boilerplate, like where, like you have to like copy. Hello, welcome. Um, it's a little boilerplate, but you have to like you know add the HTML.js file into like the uh, t the main template to include the JS file and like, yeah. include the less stuff. Um, that's something cool that like Polymer is doing. Like mm -hmm. they're allowing you to package them all into one file, mm -hmm. uh, which Angular doesn't have yet. But for now, it's just by just you know convention grouping those files. No. Is there uh, any reason? We don't need it, ultimately. Um, I've used RequireJS in the past. Um, it requires a lot of forethought into your architecture to figure out where the appropriate places are for lazy loading. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the luxury that all of our stuff are dashboards mostly. Yeah. Um, where we don't have to worry about there being, um, we don't have to worry about the weight of the code. So we can just kind of just like dump it all into the DOM and then just let it go. Um, and in terms of in the building system, uh, Jem's going to be talking about that a little bit more, how we actually get the stuff onto production. So I'm not going to step on his toes. He's going to be angry. Yeah, you're welcome, Jem. Okay, one last section, and I'll be done. Um, so another thing that we're trying to do at Turkey is open source some stuff. Yay, open sourcing. I slammed it anyways. I said I wasn't going to. Um, so yeah, we're trying to open source our things. Um, we're trying to get back to the community. We're trying to you know share because sharing is caring, and we care a lot. Um, so so, but the thing, the problem is that we're actually facing a couple of hurdles. Um, things that we didn't really realize would be. Uh, painful once we tried to open source things. Uh, the first thing that we didn't realize is that it's kind of a full-fledged product making an open source thing. Um, you actually like, it takes time. <laughs> it's like a lot of work, especially like disregarding the fact that we didn't develop with that in mind or had the luxury of like keeping two things in mind at the same time. Um, but to actually like have somebody go through and like uh, take code that is in an existing product and make it working not only for that product, but also like in a way that anybody else could benefit from. Uh, it takes time, it's work. Um, so the thing that, so like, the way that we were trying to open source is, you know, we're trying to first, you know, uh, as I was saying, like abstract that code. Like we have the CD tooltip, like it was working in our products, but there's certain aspects of that tooltip that may not be applicable towards the community at large. Um, and that's another thing that takes time, is identifying where that line should be drawn from where you should open source a component or just be like, that's too like chart specific and like that's not worth the effort. Um, what's nice about the abstraction part with Angular is that because of the way that it does directives, it um, encourages isolation of behavior so that the CB tooltip, because it's a directive and like you use it in the DOM, um, you know exactly where it's being used so you can actually like, you know, figure out wh what you need to do to actually get it out of that code base, um, which is nice that Angular helps with. Um, the other thing that uh, you actually have to do is physically move the code out of those directories into uh, a new open source directory that we have. Um, and we have to, as you were saying, like we can't break things that depend upon that. Um, and the hardest thing that we've been facing, which is uh, still debating about the best way to go about this, if you have any experience, please do talk to me afterwards because welcome ideas, opinions, whatever, um, is how to sync the code. Uh, which is so. Once we have all this code ready to be open source, we're gonna move it into its own repository, uh, publish it publicly on GitHub, um, but still then use that code in our applications. And the question then is, uh, how do we uh, create as little friction as possible for us to, di to digest that code, but also to develop that code in parallel? Uh, if there's any added friction into the process, we're not gonna be as encouraged to support that code. We'll start just making our own internal codes again to get the whole purpose of open sourcing anything. Um, so that's, it's hard. <laughs> um, so some of the ideas that we've had, some of the mechanisms that we've had for actually figuring out how to sync this code is uh, NPM, Bower, uh, Submodule, and Subtree. Um, we're not, we're leaning more towards the Git methods. Um, uh, in particular, submodule, as uh, painful as it can be at times, um, we're, we're still weighing the options. We need to investigate subtree a little bit more to see if that would be a little bit less painful. Um, but um, yeah, it's a work in progress. But we are making 
progress. Uh, so this is the open source directory as it currently exists. Uh, it is a WIP, work in progress. A lot of progress. Uh, um, but so, uh, fear not. We uh, hope to actually have this out in the public as soon as possible. I have no estimates to give you, it's, uh, <laughs> as we have time to do, but uh, definitely a priority of my own to do. Just out of curiosity, what are, what are you working on the open source things specifically? Uh, yeah, uh, I'd have to like look in the code. Uh, where like, is it just a couple of directives, or is it like a visualization tool, or is it like mostly directives? So like we one of the things that we're very well known for is our dial that you saw when Nathan was giving his introduction to open source that um, our CV tooltips is very well done. Uh, Nick developed that and uh, implemented the Amazon way of uh, hovering. Uh, you guys ever read about how they uh, create an algorithm that allows for you to hover over? an object, but then also do it at an angle. So it's not just like right lines, but it's more natural. Yeah. So a lot of heavy lifting there, which is really awesome. Hope I'm not misspeaking. <laughs> that. Um, so we're hoping to open source that as well. Um, literally anything that we use that we think has an application that like if I was to work on my own code, I'd want to use it as well. Because um, one of the sad things is like when you go from company to company, you just make this great thing in there. And you're like, well, I can't use that. Um, so yeah, uh, where's my mouse? Um, but yeah, that's all for me. Thank you so much. <laughs>